Welcome to Cultimatum, the culture of cults, a podcast dedicated to supporting survivors of cults and human trafficking. This show is hosted by myself, Anonymous Andrew. And my name is Melody. I'm going to be Andrew's co-host. I'm also a cult survivor myself of, from a cult called the House of Yahweh. I am a cult advocate and creator and administrator of a cult support group on Facebook called Cult Escape and Recovery. For guests on our show, we do want them to understand that we respect privacy concerns. You can always remain anonymous or use a fake name. And Melody, this is a safe haven for those who have been in a cult, survived, and escaped and are now on a journey of recovery trying to put their life back together. So join us as we learn together about the culture of cults. And Andrew, we also want to add a trigger warning that some episodes may contain explicit subjects including sex abuse, rape, human trafficking, suicide, and other potentially disturbing topics. Welcome to Cultimatum, the culture of cults. And my name is Anonymous Andrew, and with me I have Melody. Hi, Melody. Hi, Andrew. Um, today we have a, a guest. Her name is Kimberly, and she um, actually is was part of a church called the Cross Independent Baptist Church. She s- shares her experience of her and her family growing up in this church and i believe if i'm remembering correctly it was on it's like in a small town in on the east coast somewhere like i think virginia's or carolina's or somewhere in that area but she shares her story of basically uh being in a church where there's a pastor who kind of has a i'm going to call it a god complex and uh is pretty (laughs) controlling of his congregation and and but we'll let kimberly go ahead and share the rest of that so we'll go ahead and listen to kimberly's story now all right, and we'll chat on the other side. Yes, absolutely. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Cultimatum, the culture of cults. And hello, Melody. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And I see we have a guest. Could you tell us who absolutely. we have on the show today? Absolutely. Um, we have Kimberly. Finelli, did I say it right? (laughs) Finelli is here and she is going to share her story of being a member of the Cross Independent Baptist. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And um, all right. Yes, Kimberly, we're we're looking forward to hearing your story. And I know that Kimberly also has a book too. She's going to tell tell, she's going to tell us about that as well. So go ahead and start your story, Kimberly. Well, um, I grew up in a independent, fundamental, uh, very strict Baptist upbringing. And my parents joined that church when I was about six years old. And from there, uh, the pastor, it, it, this, this sort of pastor it was not controlling at first. Uh, it's something that escalated over time as he gained more power and more power, his influence and uh, his control, it escalated. And it was, uh, so as I joined that church and I was six, I was just a little kid. I didn't know what was going on. I just sort of did what my parents told me. But as I was, I think I first felt in my heart that something wasn't right at age 13 when the pastor really began in not only just preaching harsh sermons and, you know, and the, this is the hell and brimstone kind. Uh, it was more, he was starting to infiltrate himself into the family life. And so we had, we had a favorite teacher in school and um, that school was also a ministry of the church. It was a small Christian school. And that teacher was asked to resign because she chose to send her daughter to a Christian college that was not on his approved list. And that was my first time, I was only a seventh grader, that I knew something is not, something is off. So I went through my teenage years thinking, being told I was a rebellious girl because I wasn't going along and I was questioning because that is something he preached. You are to never, never question the pastor. You, if by questioning the pastor, you are directly questioning God because he felt he was a prophet of sorts. He never said it that way, but he felt he was sent directly by God to be the minister of the small local church uh, 
and to question him was to question God, and that was a punishable act. So I was, uh, I went through my teenage years. What kind years of punishment? Of, uh, it depended what the crime was. So if you were to question him, you would receive uh, a discipline. They call it church discipline. And they would have, so here's an example. My, my mother homeschooled my two youngest siblings, even though I was in the Christian school. Now, the Christian school being a ministry of the church, they asked the members to support that ministry financially. And so those who homeschooled were considered being disobedient to the church because they were not supporting the ministry as he preached that you should. And so he would actually take scripture out of context and preach that homeschool is not biblical. And he would he would use all kinds of scripture to back his agenda up. And so my mother questioned him for that. And she was church disciplined. She was set out of the church for a period of two months where she had to come in and be absolutely silent and she had to, until she repented of her sin and formally apologized after that two month period was o- over. And then she was allowed to be back into the fellowship. Uh, now, did he actually example. change the scriptures? Yes, he would definitely manipulate. So he would take uh, the scripture and he did it for every sermon. If he hadn't, he always had an agenda and he would, he would say, this is God's vision for the church. So he would take the scripture and pull it out of its context and stretch it and shape it to fit his current agenda. So there, therefore he is that God has given me this vision. This is what needs to be accomplished. This is what God has laid on my heart. Here's the scripture to back it up. And he would, he, and it was, his message came directly from God and he had already set in stone that he's not to be questioned because if you question God, that is a sin. So his, what he said, it went. So I would grow, go through my teenage years with a lot of angst, a lot of confusion. And I, I finally was able to get out as a young adult. And when I left, a sermon was preached against me. Okay, so you, you, your parents joined IFB and you were how old? I was six years old when they first joined wow. this church. Yes, I was only six. And you got out at the age of? I was act- I was a young adult. I was in kind of in between college. Um, it's hard, I mean, for the in my story, I have it. I have it on a timeline as just out of high school, but I had to keep my story to a timeline. But in, in like real, my real, the life, it was more, I was about 20 when okay. I was finally able to get out because I really needed to get through high school first. Yeah, that's, that's a no. solid 13 years and, and most of your teen and all of your teenage years. Yeah. yeah, it was a very confusing time for me, a very frustrating time. So, Kimberly, when you were having doubts, were you able to share that with anyone? Were you able to share that with your parents or a friend or were you able to? you know, say to anybody that you knew that I, I don't feel like this is right? No, I really was not because it, we were very careful. So for example, I, I was very good friends with the reverend's daughter who was my age. And I was extremely careful anything I said to her because I did not know what she would report back to her father. Right. I didn't want to get in trouble. And I also knew that there were certain people that would do that. Um, we called them his spies. And he, yeah. he, he, because the things that he would get wind of were like, how on earth did you know about that? Um, so you had to be very careful. It took a long time for me. And I talk about that in my, in my book a lot where it, I slowly be, am able to get to a place where I can get my parents to admit something was wrong. But it wasn't until I was probably a, at least a senior in high school when that happened. Uh, because it just, it had to come to a place for them as well that something wasn't right. Because in the beginning, it wasn't as bad. It was right. time, over time, that power and control it escalated and escalated and escalated. And that is very common in most cults. It's kind of like you're a frog in boiling water 
and when you first get in it doesn't seem dangerous you're just sitting there and you're comfortable and it escalates until you don't you know you, you're you kind of then become aware hey wait a minute this doesn't feel as comfortable as it used to um so my other question is was it difficult for you to get out did you have was that a struggle for you the biggest struggle for me leaving wasn't just leaving it was knowing that so if you leave you have to have permission to leave so that permission comes in why are you leaving so say if someone got a job out of state that's fine okay that that that's understandable so that it means you left for biblical reasons but to leave because you wanted to maybe join another local church that's not okay because mm -hmm. any other local church were considered they he preached that they have false prophets mm -hmm. so that was not okay so i had joined i was living I, my college was out of state so i had already joined i found a church that i really enjoyed a lot and so i had joined that church but i was also still a member of this church so once i finally resigned i did not give a reason i said i am this is my re resignation and i did not give a reason so for that reason i was considered leaving without biblical without permission and for unbiblical reasons i was preached against and the hardest part of that was losing everybody that i had known since i was six so most everybody was because they call it you've been cast out of the fellowship it's similar, right. very similar to what we would know as an amish shunning yes and so people i knew my whole most of my life were not so, so Kimberly, did that include your parents and your siblings? No. no, it did not. Because they were also, it could have very easily, but they, they knew something wasn't right too. So I left first, my mother left second. My father stuck around a little bit longer because Matthew, my little brother, was almost done school. Mm -hmm. And so he had one more year of school left. So my father was really trying to stick it out for him. And it didn't matter about the two youngest because they stayed home with my mother. They were homeschooled. So we kind of slowly trickled out over time, but thankfully it kind of made us stronger as a family, I think. So everybody's out now. Oh, they've been out for a long time. Yeah. But it left a lot of damage. The damage I would say it left is there, for instance, my mother is... Uh, that the whole homeschooling instance, uh, because she felt specifically targeted. And when she questioned him, she was church disciplined. And, and then it just, there was other things that happened uh, with that, that I do talk about in my story, but it was hardest on her because the collateral damage is all that trust was broken. This was someone she truly felt was her pastor for a long time. And that it was almost like a betrayal. Like, this is my pastor I trusted in and, and learned from, learned the scriptures from. And, and I think it was hard for her to go. It was probably a good solid 20 years before she could get to a place where she could step foot in the church without feeling, am I going to be judged for something? Am I going to be, mm -hmm. what's it going to be like here? And it brings up a lot of pain. And uh, that's that trauma that she has is and it's the first time that she's actually been she's been going to this one church only about a year mm -hmm. and it's that's how long it took her and and i don't think my dad was ever the same either my dad ended up going to a different church for a little while and that didn't work out either any of the damage that you so-called damage or trauma did anybody go to counseling or therapy did you did it bad enough that you felt that you needed to i I did it in some ways I did, uh, but I mean, there was other things that I, I knew looking back and once I was in a good place, the church that we were in, we, I did talk with this, this man about the, this pastor about it. And he specifically said, you have to know this isn't the right way. This isn't the way Jesus loves us. Right. And, and he he was able to really counsel us because he also counseled my husband and I right before we were married and and also it he was actually the the same pastor that married us and so that was a good it was a good transition for us to get into like wow this is what a church should be like and it is not 
about a, ju a judgment. It, it, for me, that that judgment, sometimes I can, I can go into a church now and I, I there are going to be triggers everywhere. And I talk about triggers a lot in my story where you have to be able to, to look at them and say, I see you but you cannot hurt me now and you're, you're not going to have this effect on me now. And it's, it's very liberate and that's part of that healing process. And, and I still get triggered. There's certain, maybe a hymn, a, a certain hymn in a church. And I sit there and I remember that hymn as a child and I just sit there and, and I just close my eyes because I can't do it. I cannot sing that hymn. And so there are certain, that's just one thing. But uh, I also know that even though maybe so, maybe a church, has triggered me. I know that Jesus has carried me through my hard times and I, I, I know that he loves me and has my best interests. So I know that my relationship with Jesus isn't just about a church. You know, I never gave that thought, Melody. We've interviewed many people who got out and uh, Kimberly made a transition from one church, a cult, yes. to a, a real church Right. Where she was, re you received. I, I don't want to say counseling, but you received mm -hmm. spiritual healing with the new church, and they mm -hmm. helped you make that transition. Wow. Yes, I've 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 not been able to do that myself. I'm just going to be honest. I have I have a lot of trust issues from my own experience. So I'm I'm very happy for you because I did try to go to other churches and organizations. I just I went I felt like I went in with all my walls up, and I was very very guarded, and I it never it never took. I guess we'll say. So um, now, as far as like because I know that you're that. The Cross Independent Baptist is part of the IFB, correct? It is not specifically. They consider them so, they are an independent fundamental Baptist church, but they're their okay. own. They are not okay. a part of that bigger organization. And did it have different teachings? Interesting. Like different extreme teachings? And if so, what were the some of the more extreme teachings of your particular sect? I would say the extreme teachings was all about misinterpretation it, everything KJV only I'm sure you've heard that before in that IFB that the IFB because it was really IFB even though they said they were not a part of it uh, everything was King James Version only anything else was of basically of the devil and he would I think that the as far as the extreme teachings it's when he would take a scripture and say this is what it means this is the interpretation and this is the only interpretation. And I would sit there as a teenager and young, even a young girl sometimes and look at it and I'd be like, no. <laughs> and I'd be like, but then if you say anything, you would be labeled rebellious. I was labeled rebellious quite often. And um, talking back to authority, that was a big no no. And so over time, I learned to quite honestly keep my mouth shut and internalize quite a bit, but I wrote a lot. I wrote things down. I, I dealt with it in my own way. I talked to my horse a lot. I talk about that in my story. I told her everything. And I mean, there was, I found ways to get through it at the time because I didn't know anything else. You, you mentioned your story. You have a book out. Okay. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, it's called Under Authority. I have it here. This is this is the title. It's called Under wow. Authority, and it is um, it's all about the ref. It's all about the reverend, and I talk about the first part of the story. Um, I'm an adult, and my book, my name in the story is Kate, and I, I kind of go back to visit my parents uh, after 20 years, and I hadn't been there in that long because once I left, I thought I had been leaving for good. And I, I realized that I had some things that I had to deal with and facing the past. And so um, older, older Kate revisits, has a flashback in time and she revisits the church. And it's all kind of live for my, my readers to see all live. And um, I use, I call it Christian fiction based on a true story because I wanted to draw my readers in and use the fiction to make it as real as possible. And 
the, the, I, I, I want them to actually visualize that they're watching it almost unfold as if it were right in front of them. So I have a lot of dialogue. I use a lot of visuals in the story. And I talk about, I, I put sermons in there. And one of the hardest parts for me with writing the book was I had those sermons on cassette tape because my parents never threw anything away. So they gave me the tapes and I had to listen to them again and listen to his horrible voice. And that was hard, but I really needed to incorporate that into the story and get a, get how he really sounded and how he really looked hmm. and how he preached. I needed to show my readers that because that's how he really was. And, and that can be very triggering because I've and, gone uh, back and listened to some of my leaders sermons because they're on the they're on a website they're available and i've gone actually just to kind of look to see if i could see people i know and it's very triggering yeah. just hearing that voice it's yeah. it can be very triggering and and the inflection and tone because he would screech and pound the pulpit and just those moments there's a few times i had to hit stop on the recorder and i just had to breathe for a moment and then when i was ready i would resume and I, I wanted to, I wanted to get through that so I could show my readers, and uh, this is what happened. This is what happened, and I think awareness needs to happen. And then, and the, and then I talk about, I go back again where it escalates even more. Where in the story, my parents, Kate's parents, start to understand things are not right, and it's, and people are getting hurt. And I even talk about uh, people. There's a few people that that had committed suicide in the story. I had to include that because. Uh, their their state of mind was in such a terrible place where they felt like they had no one and nothing, and they had already been cast out of a fellowship. And I think that it was it was very pertinent to the story. And and then in the end, I um, I definitely in the um, the last third of my story, I want I offer. I start with the hurt. I talk about the hurt. I talk about the why. A lot of people say, why did you stay? How could your parents stay in a place like that? I talk about that in an entire chapter. This is very important how, how and why it happened and how and why they stayed. And how and why a man that called himself a man of God was able to brainwash an entire congregation. And I talk about that in the story. And then in the end, I talk about the hope, the healing, and the forgiveness and the redemption. As far as you know, is this church, uh, this cult <clears throat> still around? And is he still the pastor? He is not. He has passed away. And uh, I talk about in, in my book, I talk about how exactly he passed away. It was a very sudden and odd, strange death. And so I do talk about that. Mm. Uh, he just fell over dead on us. And I, we, it was quite wow. a mystery and heart attack. I don't know. So the church um, was, nobody wanted it. The church, oh. <laughs> I mean, nobody wanted it. A lot of people took that as their green light. Finally, we can go and, and not, <laughs> and nothing will happen to us. And a lot of people left. Uh, I hear rumors here and there from people who know people that did stay. But last I knew, it was very meager in existence. And it was pretty in bad shape, run down, not doing well. Were you encouraged to isolate yourself from mm. friends and family or people who were not part of the church? While we were there, yes. If there was someone who would speak against the church, speak against God in any way, and were not attending a church. They were considered uh, of the world and worldly, and the Bible says we were to separate from them, to separate from the unfruitful works of darkness. And so they were not to be fellowship. And I assume that included like your extended family. We did lose some, um, a few family members over it because they, my father had a brother who was Catholic, and and since over time they have become close again. But there was a a distance between them, and um, because Catholics were not considered Christians according to them and this church, 
And also there was, I think we have another relative that was, didn't go to church or maybe, maybe they, I don't know, drank beer or something. So they were, that was considered sin. So we were not allowed to spend, we were allowed to, we were not allowed to spend time in fellowship with them, but we were allowed to keep in touch with them. They couldn't tell us, we couldn't keep in touch, like maybe write them a letter. Because that's what okay. we back then, but we couldn't spend time in fellowship with them if that makes sense. So if, I, I have a question, if the IFB didn't see Catholic, they, you said that the Catholics were, what was the term you used? Uh, they were considered, it's Catholic and any um, of the, I mean, you name it, Mormon, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, any of, or any denomination that was not, honestly, them. So there was, for instance, there was a another Baptist church down the road. Well, they said, you cannot go to that Baptist church. That Baptist church has a false leader. This is the only true church because I was placed here directly by God. That was what he would do. So did, in all of the religions primarily, except maybe the Jewish religion, did you, you didn't practice Christmas or? We did practice Christmas. Oh, you did, okay. Because in the Bible that was considered, that was Jesus' birthday. So it wasn't, the sense where some religions don't practice okay. they don't practice maybe a birthday or a christmas celebration we did we did we even put on a christmas program because that that celebrated the, the when jesus was born and a birthday was celebrated as well so we did we did that do you do you know the history of this church like before this pastor the one who passed away suddenly was there one before him? I'm, I'm kind of thinking this pastor was on a power trip. Yeah, he was. No, <laughs> he began this church back in the 70s. This church was planted by him. Okay. And a few small families at the time. And then uh, about, it was just a couple of years into it, he got a few of those families banded together and said, let's start this Christian school. It will be a ministry of the church. And it grew from there. And I grew up in that Christian school. But when he passed away, the church kind of fell apart. It, the it cult. Really yes, yeah. it really did fall apart because, I mean, if they he had a pastor in training at the time. Uh, he wasn't like an assistant pastor, but it was more of like a mentor sort of situation mm. where he had graduated from college, and so he was mentoring him and learning under him. So he, they wanted him to take, I guess the church members, the body of the church wanted him to take over. And he... He said no, and I don't well, even know his story because I don't know what happened. And but he said, "I cannot be here. I have been hurt very much by this church, and I, I feel like it's best for my family and I to go." And since then, uh, there was this other, another pastor. I think it was my old Bible Bible teacher, I believe, that had taken taken over. But last I knew, the church was in very meager, meager existence. I wonder why, uh, and, and this may seem obvious to me, but I, I, so you were IFB, but not part of the other IFBs. Why, I'm wondering why one of them wouldn't have swooped in and, and so you're, it's like a company that's faltering, but so another company will come in and, and buy them and, or you see where I'm going? Why, why wouldn't the other IFB come in and say, hey, if that pastor is, has passed away, it's a perfect opportunity. Because, I, Melody, I remember t interviewing one of the, I forget who it was, Mandy or Jessica, that, that was an IFB. They they were all about spreading, right? They were about yes, expanding. Yes, lots of different IFBs. So, but, but it sounds like hers was isolated from the the main chain of IFBs. I'm going to call it a chain for lack of a better word. Be yeah. Because the pastor wanted it that way. But once he's gone, that's why I'm thinking, why didn't they take that opportunity to come in? And, uh, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for another IFB cult, which is silly, but <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> I, I still understand what you mean, though. Yeah. I'm just um, wondering. They just seem like a perfect opportunity for them to come in and, and take over and. Okay. My like guess that. is they as didn't know about know it. That, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Emily. One, they did not know about it. 
because they were very isolated. Also, uh, as part of the school that he wanted to grow, he decided to construct a gymnasium. And this was a very small church in New England, uh, total about 200 members or so. It gives you an idea how big it was. And so that is very difficult for families in New England to come up with money for a gymnasium. But he decided this is what we're going to do, and he made it happen. And through different funding, I talk about that a little bit in my story more. But because of that, there was a hefty debt that was attached uh -huh. to the church. I don't think, I think that they were considering selling it and maybe having a new pastor buy it out and start. And I, from what I understand from this person that knew this person, nobody wanted it. Nobody, nobody, yeah. wanted, nobody wanted the headache. Nobody wanted the mm. turmoil wanted the debt that's that's as far as i understand so kimberly what would you feel were some of the most traumatic things that you experienced being part of the group the most well, there was a lot um Wow, where do you begin with that? There were so many different things. As a student of the school, and because it was all together, you were if you went to that church, you were a student of that school. Um, many of the hardest things that the rules and the regulations and what they expected were extremely strict. We everybody had to be a certain way. You had to look a certain way. Your skirt had to touch that floor. I mean, you had to be, you you know, we, we, we lined up for eye checks and make sure we weren't wearing eye makeup in high school. And if we were, we were given a fine. And there were, I mean, I could go on and on and on about the things. So living a, a life under a very, I've always felt there was just this heavy weight on me. And I think in my heart, you know, looking back as a teenager, I think that I knew all along something wasn't right. But I think the hardest thing was having to internalize it all the time. Mm. Questioning, why can't I just go along to get along? What is wrong with me? Well, everybody says I'm rebellious. Maybe I am rebellious because I have said a few things here and there. And I have maybe com made a comment like, oh, what's happening here? And that is not welcome. And that does get back to the powers that be. So... I think the knowing that that I just not having a voice, I, I, I think is what I'm trying to say, mm. not having a voice and just being that robot while you're there and you have no feeling you have, you are nothing. You are the, the shepherd is the pastor. You are his sheep and you follow and obey. And that is all we were ever told. You obey and you be quiet and you follow. And that tattletaling thing. How that... are? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, well, no, I was going to ask, how are you today? I'm I'm great. I really am because I I see so much and and this is one thing I was asked recently. I spoke at a ladies' group. They read my story and they asked me to come speak with them, and I was absolutely delighted to do so. And they said. Uh, how did you how did you go through that and write this? How did you do that? Right. Because one woman said that she's been through a tra traumatic experience in a church, and she said that she has flatlined. She said, I have no feeling. I cannot write about it. I can't even go there in my mind. And I said, I think I was meant to do this because I was the one who noticed things. I noticed everything. I felt it so early on when either others, either they didn't or couldn't say it. And I did say it and I got in trouble for it too, for saying something. And I felt like this was my purpose to, to write this story. It took me a long time to be able to get to a place where I could write this story and therefore use the story to help other people, help them know, yes, this is real. Your feelings are validated. There's nothing wrong with you. And there's nothing wrong with Jesus, the real Jesus. Mm. And, and it is this, this type of pastor 
you are you have been through a religious trauma and it is real and validating for that for them because they've a lot of people that I've talked to they don't feel that they can just talk about it even with some of their closest and best friends because they feel like who is going to understand who on earth is going to understand something like this so they don't talk about it and they internalize it and I think that um, podcasts like yours and my story that is out there and the Facebook group that you have, Melody, is incredible yes. because I think it is giving people that moment where they can realize they're not alone. They can have the permission to have these hard conversations. And I think that is worth everything. Oh, I agree 100%, Kimberly. And that is actually, you know, was a lot of my motivation in starting the Facebook group is because when I left my cult and group, I was looking for that kind of support. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> and I was like, there's got to be something out here mm -hmm. that's, that can help these people, that can help us, because mm -hmm. I know I'm not alone. And the more research I did, the more I figured out I wasn't alone, that there are lots of other people out there who have experienced very similar um, trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, But I'm going to jump back just a little bit, because I want to touch on that tattletaling thing, because that is very indicative of cults mm -hmm. too. And that is by design. It is by mm -hmm. design and it has its twofold purposes. First of all, it not only keeps people in line and afraid to do what they're not supposed mm -hmm. to because they think they're going to be tattled on, but you also, mm -hmm. it, it creates this environment of complete distrust even of the people that you're closest to there's this, this huge amount of distrust to where you don't know who you can and can't trust so you feel more and more isolated because you're you're more likely to keep your mouth shut because you're like oh gosh I'd really like to say something like you were saying about your friend that was the reverend's daughter you probably at times really mm -hmm. wanted to share more with her and actually um you know grow the friendship mm -hmm and grow the trust, but you couldn't, mm -hmm. you couldn't, you just felt isolated. Yes. Yes. And even with some of my other friends, because you didn't know who they were going to talk to and you didn't know if maybe they were going to accidentally, even though they were my friends, you know, if they were to accidentally say something to maybe a parent or a sibling. And then it was incredible that the church was to around 200 people. It was small enough yet big enough where you had your you had your people that you were close with, but you were still careful mm. and everybody was careful. And here's an example of that. Going back to the homeschooling issue, uh, there was a couple families. It wasn't just my mother. There was a couple families. Her best friend homeschooled and her best friend homeschooled her son because he was a special needs child. That mm. school wasn't equipped to handle a special needs child. So she did. She homeschooled him and taught him how to read. And there was no way he could be in a regular classroom. Well, it didn't matter. It wasn't okay. And then um, he, they decided to take their middle son out of the school because he was not doing well in the school and homeschool him as well. So you know what they did? They paid tuition to make the pastor happy. They paid tuition to the school mm. and homeschooled him at the same time. Oh, and then that it was acceptable. Said, your and that was okay. That was okay because well, really what it boiled down to, it was not really anything but the money. The money. Yeah. Follow the money. <laughs> Follow that money, yes, because they had a lot of debt to pay for it. And then so my mother, this 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 mom of these two boys would go to another family. She went to another family and she went with the purest intention, never said one bad word about the reverend and just said, hey, Listen, I'd like to talk to you as, you know, the Bible says, bear one another's burdens and, and share with each other's and, and pray for each other and lift each other up. And and she went to her in confidence or she thought was in confidence and said, yeah, this is what's happening. I'm feeling kind of sad about it and didn't ever said one word about it. And boy, did she get that letter of, in the mail pretty quick. Yeah. Because they were reported. So. So besides writing your book, what other things have you done to work towards your recovery? Um, towards my recovery, uh, I, I know my limits. I know I can, and I, but see, it, saying know my limits, what I mean is so say my husband and I moved to South Carolina in 2018. 
And so we were considering, let's, let's see what church we, if we want to be a part of a church, it would be good for our boys to be a part of a, maybe a youth group and get to know some families here because we didn't know anybody. So we visited some churches and a couple of the churches that we visited, one in particular, we, we just were like, wow, that is so this line of thinking. So as far as my recovery, I have taught myself, I recognize the signs, I would say, where uh, a pastor is getting up and when there's opinion being asserted or an agenda and they're taking, I would say scripture out of context or they're saying, well, this is the interpretation and this is what it means. And it's, it's like he could have said, this is what it means to me. And it might mean something different to you. Right. And so sometimes what, uh, because not everyone's your interpretation of one verse and your interpretation, Andrew, of one verse might be this. And my interpretation might be this. And guess what? That's okay. Right. But according to say that reverend, it's not okay. What he says is okay. What he says is right and true. And I've come over time in my own walk and towards healing is I've come to recognize that. And I'm like, I am not going to be a part of an organization like that. I will never be a part of a church that I see that in. And that is taking that control. So you've learned to set up healthy boundaries for yourself. Absolutely. I really have. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. That's one, one step I've taken. And I'm not going to lie. There's some places that I go in that I've, I've been to, or maybe something someone says in a conversation. I work at a Christian school, and I'm in, I'm in a preschool. And then I'll be talking to some somebody, and they'll a conversation will come up, and they'll say something. And I, for a moment, I might just close my eyes because I recognize a particular line of thinking that I've been down that road, and I, I know it's not right. And so I'm, I'm, I just have a lot of awareness where, where, where people go with their, with their judgment. And I just, I have made a vow to, to never do that to anybody because. So I when you're triggered, you step find, back. Find their, yeah, I would say that that's a definite, accurate, accurate, accurate description. And also just because I'm triggered, I step back. It doesn't mean I'm running away. I, I do face that trigger. And I say, I see you. I recognize you. You cannot hurt me now. But I'm also not going to be a part of an organization that that is going to be rampant either. So. Okay. <laughs> Kimberly, I, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Is there anything? So in our audience, there might be somebody who you mentioned the Facebook groups who may have just left a cult or is thinking of leaving an organization. Any words of wisdom, support, advice advice that you could give somebody? Mm -hmm. My biggest advice is Jesus is the one who loves you unconditionally with you can come to him and your relationship is with Jesus, not a church. We follow the true Jesus, not a man. And my biggest thing to everybody who is in a cult thinking about leaving and doesn't know how to get out you're stronger than you think find the support melody you're here and and there's countless people that are here look for that support it is out there awareness is out there um and i can i can be reached to on facebook and and i'm happy to talk with people and if anybody's interested in hearing more about my story i can talk with them as well so the support is out there. Just be strong. You're not alone. That's my biggest thing because I think that a lot of people that have been through a traumatic experience, they feel so damaged and they feel so isolated and alone. And they're, they're, I just my encouragement is that you're not. You're not alone. That's very uh, kind of you to offer support. And we will, if you, in the show notes, we will put your book and any other information that you want to share. So if they want to reach out to you. Yes, I I appreciate that. I think that's an excellent, excellent way to close your interview. And I, um, I, I love that you're, that you're offering up even of your personal time and yourself. That's amazing. That's amazing and very selfless. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people would appreciate that. 
hopefully you've already had some people reach out to you because of your book, but um, I think that's awesome. We appreciate having you come on the show and share your story with us. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Oh, it's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay. And again, we want to thank Kimberly for coming on the show and sharing her story and her experience with us. And her book, again, is titled Under Authority. And we will include a link. Um, at, I don't know if she has a Facebook page but we'll, if, for the book, but if not, we'll include a link. To, I think it's available on Amazon, and we can include a link to that, I believe, at the end of the... Can we yeah, that? we'll find out. We'll put all that in the show notes. Okay. So, but yeah, I, we'll, we'll include all that in the yeah. show notes, so you should be able to find a link to all of that information. And um, so we want to, again, thank Kimberly for coming on and sharing her story with us. Um, and for everyone out there, you can show your support by rating our show on either Apple or Spotify. You can also follow us and share and continuing continue listening to our latest episodes to show your support you can also show your support by joining our facebook community under the name cultimatum if you'd like to share your story with us you can email us at cultimatum podcast at gmail.com and if you're an ex-cult member you can find more support at cult escape and recovery group on facebook and if you'd like to hear more of me you can find me on my other podcast, Anonymous Andrew Podcast, Life and the Choices We Make. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And Melody, we'll talk next week. Yes, thanks again. Bye-bye.